Hey, everybody. Welcome to the second anniversary of doing these crazy weekly webinars. Oh, my goodness. Um, so, yes, it's St. Patrick's Day. It's our 102nd week anniversary and the second anniversary. So, Jack Shamrock Santaniello is uh, somewhere in Disney World. So he is skipping out on us. And he was not present for the first few weeks with us anyway. He was evidently on the, the line, but he uh, was not one of the panelists. So today he's, you know, drinking green beer, wearing a leprechaun outfit at uh, the Magic Kingdom, evidently. So, and Adam is skiing with his family and he joined us because he knew that I couldn't answer your questions and at least, you know, intelligently. <laughs> so he's, he's going to hit the slopes as soon as we're done here. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, he is in the, uh, the, I don't know what you call it, the star bridge. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to get with the program. Um, it's either. <laughs> I was never a background. Trekkie. Yeah, it's either seen in the background of the original series Enterprise, or you can see a really crappy um, hotel room. So I thought this would be a better <laughs> option for you. But it, it you yeah, know, it no, is kind of great. It is kind of funny commentary around, um, you know, the whole working remotely thing in terms of, um, you know, taking advantage of a two hour time zone change. So got up at, you know, five o'clock. Um, time here but it's seven o'clock time east coast and you know got a bunch of stuff done and then i can take a little window of time and then you know hop back on and wrap up everything for the day since i don't have a lot of people that i have to talk to outside of this webinar today so just you know as much as we talked about um you know team building and and culture and you know you got to get people back together for trust building and um innovation all of that is true and at the same time this is the other side of the equation in terms of, you know, balance, you know, going with the concept of balance in your life is created. It's not something that you just find somewhere. I mean, you got to search for it and actually create it for yourself. So uh, this is just the, the other side of it, which, you know, when we think about BGW, you know, we still want to give everybody in the company the opportunity to do stuff uh, like this, um, you know, and still meet the needs of our clients. So I, with that, I will shut up. I got a little green in the shirt and I see you wearing green too. Um, Gary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cleveland city stars. We, we lasted for a few years, but we did actually win the USL championship. I was on the board. And so they gave me my own Jersey. <laughs> which is, yeah, was fun. There you go. I decided not to wear my green and white wig today for y'all, <laughs> but I do have it. Um, Hey, also, Real quick question or real quick uh, notice, if anybody didn't notice, so the Senate can, it's good to know that our, our elected officials can agree on one thing, time zone change. So evidently this is, we're going to have daylight savings time permanent, but we got to go through another gyration next year because Amtrak and all the uh, airlines and whatever, uh, their schedules are already set evidently for in the fall. So Nonetheless, um, it's good to know that our elected officials are hard at work declaring that um, daylight savings time is going to be in effect forever until they change their mind. Uh, one other thing that I thought we'd talk about before we go into a poll. So we've got some more of the top 100 poll questions and we'll, we'll launch that for you guys. Um, but what was interesting is, you know, on culture, I was talking to a friend of mine that they have been virtual and they've got about a hundred and some employees and they've, they've always been virtual, virtual. They're, they're a software as a service company. And we, we've been asking people like, how do you maintain culture in a remote environment? Well, one thing it's, it's a little bit easier, I suppose, if you started out a hundred percent remote. But there are some things that, that he told us that I thought were really interesting. Um, one was the number one thing, hire for culture. And, you know, and one of their, you know, core values was, um, what was it? It was like, find a way. 
something like that. I don't remember what the deal was, but they're, they're really big on teamwork and that sort of thing. And so they hire appropriately. They let people know, hey, you're going to have to kind of come with batteries. You got to be a self-starter and um, we want you to engage. But another thing that they do is they meet quarterly. Everybody flies in together and they have a, a couple days together. So that's one way that they do it. And then they also have Slack channels where they have, you know, a water cooler kind of uh, talk. They have kind of a celebrations thing where they're, they're doing shout outs for one another um, that, you know, recognize and reward, if you will, but recognizing really behavior that, that fits their core values, which I thought was really good. And then they have kind of a, um, a tone from the top, if you will channel from the leadership team that's and, and that's their communication module so a, a few good tidbits that I thought were kind of worth looking at because quite frankly we're probably going to be in a hybrid environment for a while so anyway anything you want to add to that before I launch polls Adam no I just it it um might have said it in a previous webinar is that you know when you when you come back to the team building you know the the gurus in the virtual sorry the gurus of culture which you know at the end of the day you know there's there's, there's a few of them but two that we listen to are Patrick Lencioni and Simon Sinek you know have both kind of given up on um, you can create innovation and trust in a virtual environment so I think what we're finding in our own exploration of virtual teams and 100 percent percent virtual is there's still a lot of live one-on-one -on -one stuff that occurs because nobody's mastered the you know how do you build trust virtually you know e even even if it's live you know more intentional one-on-one -on -one teams meetings <laughs> you know and and, and if you got to have innovation that's going to happen brainstorming you don't do that over zoom you bring everybody together for that so it's a long way of saying that you know i think the answer is you know people got to be together in some capacity, even if you don't have an office. So that, that's all. Yeah, that's good. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. Last week, we talked a little bit finding cash in balance sheet, I think, but we didn't go into finding cash in your P&L. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. If you guys would vote for whichever uh, question you'd like to have Adam pontificate on. <laughs> so if you would start, find your pull button. There we go. Managing overhead costs. So far, we got some action there. Keep rolling. Benchmarking, budgeting, forecasting. Ah, you guys are on it. This is good. I can't see the results, so you're going to have to help me out here, Gary. <laughs> yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share the results with you all. Can you see it now? All right. Yep, got it. All right, okay, cool. we, 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 we can we can do this. All right, so <laughs> let's, let's start off with, um, yeah, I think we can probably know all three of these, um, which is timely because we just trained our internal team about this on Monday. So benchmarking budgeting and forecast we're going to start there because they're all somewhat related um in some respects so you know I'll, oftentimes we get asked you know how am i doing relative to my peers you know how can i make more money you know stuff like that and i think you know the first thing to think about when it comes to benchmarking is there, there's really you know two ends of this spectrum of benchmarking you know most benchmarking data that you can get that's available to you remember is just an average it means you're middle of the pack that's what you are the, you know that that's 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 the benchmark is what does it take to be at the average you know and you know some of them throw out the highs some of them throw out the lows to hit to the standard bell shaped curve but it's still you know it's it's just an average um another version of benchmarking is what does it take for me to be best in class? Like, what do I need to be aiming for to be best in class? Um, that data is a lot harder to find in terms of what it takes to be best in class. So, you know, you, you can kind of 
so what I'll tell you about that is that what we encourage our clients to do is to land, you know, somewhere in the middle between average and best in class. And if you're not at average yet, at least push yourself to try to get to average. And then, you know, every year try to make some incremental improvement because, you know, if you kind of think about the theory, the compounding effect, if you can improve, you know, one or 2% a year, you know, that, that makes a big difference in terms of, you know, going from, you know, a, a, a 15% EBITDA number, you know, to a 20% EBITDA number, you know, you, you improve 2% a year, you know, suddenly you've gone from average to best in class, you know, through a very thoughtful, um, time, you know, time frame. So when it, when it comes down to, um, benchmarking, you know, budgeting and forecasting, you know, I, I think, our recommendation has always been, you got to start with, is the owners of the company, if you're not putting between your salary um, plus EBITDA, you know, if that bottom line EBITDA percentage, including your owner pay and owner fringe benefits, if it isn't at least 10%, you got to ask yourself a question, what am I doing? You know, and then once you get there, push for, you know, push for 15%. And then I think kind of the theoretical max that you can probably hit you know, in any of our companies in any industry is probably about 25%. Because when you go beyond 25%, then it means that you probably aren't scaling very effectively. Meaning like, sure, you're at, you know, 35%, but you're a $2 million company. When you could be a $20 million company, but at 25%, that 25% in absolute terms is way more than your you know, 30% at, at, or 35% at 2 million. So at some point, you know, I think our, our, our history has shown that 25% is kind of, kind of the theoretical maximum of any company, any industry, doesn't matter what you are in terms of owner fringe benefits plus, plus EBITDA. So I would kind of start there. And then when it comes to, you know, so, so in terms of establishing a budget, you know, you kind of start with, well, what do I, you know, what do I want EBITDA to be? <laughs> and owner fringe benefits, and then, you know, look at my existing cost structure and kind of build out, well, what would sales need to be to support that? And that's either going to tell you that you've got a realistic sales target. In other words, like, if you're like, well, geez, I'd have to have 400% sales growth. I've never done that before. You're like, ah, geez, <laughs> you know, but instead, if it's like, eh, you know, 15% sales growth number, we've done that before, maybe last year was 10%. We think we could do that again, or you're right on the borderline, you know, and you're like, well, it's more real, realistic that we'll get 10% sales. You know, let's start that. Then you would dive in and say, let me start looking at the cost structure. Um, it just, you know, I think peer, at least once a year, people ought to really dig in and look at their cost structure and start challenging assumptions in terms of like, <clears throat> why do we do that? Why do we need that? You know, are we as efficient as we could be? Um, and what, what you end up finding by going through that exercise is that, you know, it, it's sort of like, you know, Superman three, <laughs> you know, a lot of little eliminations add up to be a big, <laughs> you know, a bit, a, a big, a big thing, you know, when you're finally, when you're finally said and done. So what I'd recommend here is that you kind of, it kind of gets into labor costs and overhead rates is that. What you go back and, you, you know, you just go back and you say, look, labor is a percentage of sales. Let's just go back and look at our history as to what that's been. All labor is a percentage of sales. What's that been historically? Has it been fluctuating over time? You know, is there a point in our, in our history where it was better than it is today? What was different and how do we get back there? You know, then, then really ask yourself, does my team really have the ability to either work, you know, to, to do more because we've got capacity that they're not using or alternatively to work more efficiently. Um, you know, I, ultimately you also have to take a look at your customers. In other words, you know, and I'll give you a you know, real world example from BGW is that, you know, we've got a client in one of our offices that, you know, when you look at the hourly rate that we're charging that client, we're actually paying them to do their work. <laughs> You know, meaning like when you look at the, the labor cost, of the employee that is working on that work um, relative to what we pay that employee, we're in the red. 
in terms of direct cost, <laughs> um, which is just a kind of a legacy pricing problem that that we inherited that we're working our way through with the customer. But you also have to look at your customer, your customer base and what they're paying you, because, you know, it could be that your team is working highly efficiently. Um, but at the same time, if Gary is willing to give me a dollar for the same work that Timmy's willing to give me two dollars for. I love Gary, but why would I continue with that? <laughs> you know, um, like that should be a conscious decision that that the answer isn't just, ah, you, you know, Sally, you need to work harder, you know, for us to hit this number. I mean, you, you have to throw customer profitability um, into the mix. So what I always recommend doing is, you know, again, to kind of close the loop on this, you got to first off look at what do you make it, you know, and is that kind of sufficient? Then back into, all right, let's really take a deep dive into my cost structure and what can I do without, um, you know, what, what have we let kind of get out of control, um, you know, and ask ourselves if we've had a better point in our history, what's it going to take to get back to that, that history. And then lastly, you know, you also have to look at your customer profitability to see if, you know, if you've underpriced stuff. And, and remember, in a lot of cases, underpriced could be, you know, I've had scope creep, you know, I've done a bunch of change orders that I haven't billed for because I don't have controls around those change orders. Um, so let me take a look at those as well. But, you know, what I've, what I've found is that, you know, most clients that we have, you know, that, that are feeling pretty happy with how, how they're doing, you know, if I ask them, so you're telling me that, you know, you really don't have any rework, you know, you don't have any places where you had a scope change that you didn't bill for, you know, and I get, you don't have anybody that you're getting about 50% productivity out of them. <laughs> you don't have any customers that if you had the opportunity to reprice the work today, it'd be you know significantly higher than what you're doing it for. The answer to that is typically no. And when you add all those things up, you know, it could be, depending on the size of the company, it could be millions. You know, it's a lot of little things that add up to a very big number. So then you get back to, okay, that's cool that's extra cash flow this year. But if you multiply that times five, which is the value of your company, that's a pretty significant value increase that you got by going through, you know, maybe a two to three day exercise to figure out where you're at and what you can do to improve it. And then, you know, kind of doing the hard work to get there. Good. You want to hit any of those other ones that are still up there? Yeah. So to get, super specific on, you know, labor costs and overhead costs. When I, when I mentioned <clears throat> labor as a percentage of sales, you know, it's simply just saying if all, just pick a number, whether it's actual salary or it's all, all labor overhead, including health insurance. I mean, it doesn't really matter as long as your measurement is consistent. You know, it, if, if historically that's been 25% for you, and now it's 30%, you just need to ask yourself, why is that? You know, do I have a good reason for that? Um, just so, just so that you've got, you, you've got an answer for yourself. And then you just try to manage and control it from there. You know, when somebody comes up to you and says, ah, here's on trying, I need 20 more people. You know, what's that going to do to your labor percentage? Just to see if you model that out and see if it makes sense for you, you know, based on where you um, historically bit historically a bit. It's one of the places where looking in the rearview mirror actually can give you some good information about what your future, um, what your future might have in store for you. Um, overhead costs, you know, same sort of thing, you know, just running them as a percentage of sales, knowing that eventually they should kind of fix in at an absolute number because a lot of overhead costs are not variable based on sales. They're fixed variable, meaning, you know, rent is rent until I need more space, <laughs> then it steps up. All right, good. All right, I'm gonna launch another poll. Let's do, how about some demystification of tax strategies? <laughs> Let's launch this one. All right, go ahead and rock and roll, people. I'm anxious to see what has the greatest interest for y'all. Can y'all see it? Yep, all right, we've got voting going on. Uh, 
Okay. While we're waiting for everybody to vote and while the votes are coming in, Robert Mayetta, good to see you here. Uh, here's a good question from Robert. China's locked down several large cities this week due to COVID. How, this will impact slide the supply chain and make it worse. Suggestions on how to prepare for this. Any thoughts? You know, we've had, we've had, the, you know, other than just making sure you've got sufficient working capital, your bank relationships are in place, you know, pretty well. I think we've had, we've had some questions before about, you know, boning up on inventory and, you know, so that that could be a strategy for you, but the, you know, the, or, or, you know, knowing that you're going to have a longer lead time, you know, advising your customers to get orders in, you know, early, you know, just in the event that, that you're going to have that, but, you know, you got to balance that against um, inventory obsolescence. You know, I mean, it, you know, it's it like, it, it's funny, but it's not funny. You know, we've got a few clients that are that were in the PPE business that are sitting on a lot of face masks, you know, a lot, a lot of hand sanitizer right now. I mean, like the lots, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that that they they bulked up because you know it's not the end of the world. I mean, they got a premium for a lot of those things when the market was pretty hot. So it's just something you got to balance in terms of just evaluating your obsolescence risk um, as you're as you're brushing up or as you're boning up potentially. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share the results. We got a tie on a couple of these. Can you see it, Adam? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gonna be tough. Uh, so, how do I how do I avoid paying taxes like the big companies? Um, so, good question there. Um, the answer is uh, a lot of cash and a lot of patience. <laughs> and also when you start hearing about the corporate minimum tax, um, you know, and doing something around that, that this is what they're talking about. So uh, in our backyard, um, not in Steamboat Strings, but in, in North Carolina, Duke Energy has not paid income taxes for quite some time and they won't pay income taxes for quite some time. So why is that? Um, well, it's a combination of things. In Duke Energy's case, um, they buy a bunch of equipment and they get depreciation. So that is available to all of y'all is you could just buy a bunch of stuff and get depreciation on it. You know, that's ultimately just a timing difference, you know, and in Duke's case, they're just, they're big, not, you know, it's, it's big equipment with a lot of depreciation expense. So, you know, they have federal taxable income, you know, that's that and they're able to immediately depreciate and expense stuff which is completely different from the accounting income that they report to the sec because you know i build you know a four bajillion dollar solar panel array i can expense that in the current year for tax purposes but that's over 15 years um for the accounting profit that i report to the sec so that that that's way number one that is available to everybody way number two are tax credits um, so with tax credits, you, um, you know, the, in Duke's case, you know, they get credits for producing, you know, energy efficient power that may be available to some people on the call, but, um, probably not, but you do have some credits that are available to you. You've got the ERC credit that was part of the stimulus package. Um, if you're in the restaurant business, you got the bike tip credit. Um, if you're in, the, if you're hiring people that are in certain work classes, you've got, work opportunity tax credits. Um, if you've got um, some aspect of research and development, which is a pretty broad category that applies to a lot of people, you've got some RD credits that are available. So the second place to dig in, in terms of not have to pay taxes like a big company, is just to you know make sure that you're digging in based on the attributes of your company, getting every credit that you could possibly be due. Um, so that, that's, that's the basics that are available to everybody. Um, from there, you start to get into, um, a little bit of the exotics, um, which will touch a little bit into the cash line around best ways to avoid taxes. So, um, 
so one, so if you, if you separate out Duke Energy, for an example, and go to a company like Salesforce.com um, or another big kind of startup company that's that's not paying taxes and probably won't, you know, for a long time. And in both Salesforce and Duke Energy's cases, I mean, it's like, you know, dozens of years. In Duke's case, it's actually 50 years. If they just had the same accounting profit they've had, doubled it, paid taxes on it, it would take 50 years for them to defer or to pay off or to, to burn through all the stored up, you know, tax sheltering that we've given them through the tax code, perfectly legal, um, but it but effectively is an interest-free loan that we're given um, Duke Energy and Salesforce and everybody else. So the other way that the other way that you can get the benefit um, of a tax deduction are stock options to your employees. Um, so uh, through a feature in the in the tax code you know if i give gary you know some stock options that are worth a lot but he hasn't had the ability to exercise them i get the best of both worlds i get the tax deduction um for the compensation expense associated with those stock options but i don't actually have to have that take a hit in totality to my accounting profit. So I look great for the SEC, bad for the tax man. <laughs> um, so if you look at a company like salesforce.com, why aren't they paying taxes? Well, way number one are all these executive stock option incentives that they've got, they've taken tax deductions for. Their employees don't quite have the right to yet and haven't exercised yet. And they're not reporting yet as SEC accounting profit yet. So they're looking good on both pictures, not paying taxes, but having great book income for their investors. Um, then, uh, then you know, Salesforce.com also has the R&D credit, which I talked about before. So, you know, big company move number one that small companies typically do not do are going to be anything around, you know, tax, you know, tax advantaged, you know, stock option or incentive plans for your employees. Um, that's number one. Number two is if you look at, and that, so that, that's one that you just got to get comfortable that internal secession is kind of the way that you want to go and you want to figure out how to get a deduction out of it. Um, number two, which is more of a patience um, factor that, that could go away with some of the proposed tax legislation in terms of corporate minimum tax. But if you also look at salesforce.com, you also look at Nike. Um, what they do is they set up a company in a foreign jurisdiction and they put all their patents and trademarks there. This is another thing you can do if you had extra cash, by the way, for that last question. They put all their patents and trademarks in that foreign jurisdiction <clears throat> and then pay a royalty fee from the U.S. entity <clears throat> to the foreign entity. So they get a deduction for U.S. tax purposes, but for book accounting purposes, it's right hand, left hand. I get to eliminate those transactions. So we really get to see what Nike makes globally. <clears throat> but for US purposes, they're not paying taxes. Now, the patient strategy on that is if Nike would like its money back in the US, it's got to pay a repatriation tax. <clears throat> and there are starting to be some minimum taxes on you know extra cash sitting on balance sheets for companies that have come out as the last um, tax code change. But yeah, those are pretty significant dollars that if you just, you know, I don't know the stats off the top of my head, but if you look at domestic based companies with cash sitting overseas, they haven't re repatriated. It's like <coughs> excuse me, trillions of dollars, you know, multiply that times the tax rate, you got the deferred tax amount that's sitting, sitting off that. I mean, that's one of the few, revenue raising things that happened with the Trump um, tax legislation that happened is they, they, they allowed companies to do kind of a one-time repatriation at a lower rate. Reagan did it too back in his day um, to repatriate some cash and get it, you know, taxed in the U S at a lower rate. So that, that's another way um, that, that big companies do all the time. Um, the last thing that you can do <coughs> with extra cash line around is that, you know, our favorite go-to moves, you know, after I've deducted all my own fringe benefits is that, you know, you could, um, 
you know, there, there are differing levels of retirement plans that are available. And, you know, the, the super, you know, the super duper, you know, high end retirement plan is uh, basically the equivalent of an old school pension plan. I mean, the, the technical term for it is a defined benefit plan or cash balance plan, but it's basically where I say, Gary, <coughs> you're awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to guarantee that when you retire, I'm going to give you a million bucks and I'm going to just start saving money off for you. Well, that's a tax deduction for me as the company, not taxable income to Gary um, as the employer, as the owner of the company. So that's another biggie that's available to our uh, small business customers that, that big companies do as well. All right, good. Bruce, good to see you here. Thank you for, you always bring good questions too. I think you're giving Robert May a, a run for his money. <laughs> but here's the question. Uh, Adam, so when governments revert to gimmicks like eliminating payroll taxes or business use taxes for a period of time, but the companies and or individuals who benefited from the deferral immediately declare bankruptcy when the tax liability is restored, where do governments stand in line for the settlement? Are they first in line to be paid in full or do, uh, do they outlast other claimants who need some settlement quickly? Oh boy, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but well, sorry. So, so my best guess answer, which I think is correct, um, is that when you look at payroll, to, payroll taxes in general, and you break them up into two categories, the trust taxes, which are the withholding and the social employer or sorry, employee portion of the social security taxes, the trust tax are going to be first in line pretty much every time, you know, good luck with that. And I, you don't get them discharged in bankruptcy either when that happens. Um, so that just means they're going to come first, you know, they don't get discharged in bankruptcy, you know, liens are going on houses. It's just bad, bad, bad for the, per for, for the person, you know, you kind of, you see those commercials for Optima tax relief, um, you know, and, and they, you know, the people that are on Optima tax relief is the customer always look at like they're in a Caribbean location talking about how they got out of all these payroll taxes <laughs> due to negotiated <laughs> settlement. Um, I have never seen that happen. <laughs> I mean, you've got to like, you know, be near death, something horrible happened <laughs> with no ability to earn income ever again is the only, that's way number one that I've seen people get out of trust taxes. So it's gotta be real, 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 real bad. Um, so people that I know that have tried, you know, those tax relief places have not, I mean, they're basically just forked it over some money and then got nothing for it. So if you want to try that route, you can, I don't recommend it. Um, route number two is you, you know, you basically go on the lamb and buy on the lamb, meaning, you know, you change banks frequently. Again, I don't recommend this, but it's a way to do it. You change banks frequently. And, um, you know, so the IRS has trouble finding you. And if you wait long enough, which I think the statute of limitation is either seven or 10 years on trust taxes, eventually the IRS will just give up on you. Um, but it, I mean, it means that you're basically, you know, operating out of the shadows to get out of the debt. Um, otherwise, I would just get on a payment plan with the IRS and try to, you know, work it off, you know, at that level. So then when you get to, to route number two, which is the employer taxes, which would be use tax, you know, use taxes and um, the employer portion of FICA, um, I believe those can be discharged in bankruptcy and in priority order. I would think that it probably thought it probably is going to go employee back pay lien holders, then whatever would normally happen because those are considered unsecured um, credit obligations. So that that's, that's my best guess, Bruce. Great question. Yeah. I get that's asked that you're when on. Jack's not here. Yeah. I get asked that when Jack's not well, here. <laughs> okay. So, Jack is here. Um, he is drinking green green beer in front of a pub. <laughs> he just sent me this photo. <laughs> yeah, got it. Okay. Good. 
Good for him. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he was able to get away. All right. So I'm going to take us to getting every credit due. Um, and then I've got a fun poll that we're going to wrap up with after this one. Okay. Getting every credit due. Go ahead and hit those uh, voting buttons. <laughs> What's funny is, given the day that it is today, it is St. Patrick's Day, and yet there is nobody voting for green credits. <laughs> good, good, because that's the one that I actually know the least about. So, <laughs> I mean, I know enough to be dangerous, but they change pretty frequently. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, there's a runaway winner here on employee benefit credits. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the results with y'all. Yeah. Um, so on employee benefit credits, <clears throat> you've got you've got a couple um, that sit here. Um, you know, the first one is just pandemic relief. Um, so that's on the pandemic relief side, you know, you've got the, you know, everything that kind of fell under, I think it's called the FFCRA, but it's everything that falls under kind of the category of the Family Medical Leave Act, which is basically, you know, Gary, I'm going to give you some paid time off to care for um, the elderly, you know, or sorry, the people in your household that were sick. I'm going to give you some paid time off to care for your kid um that that got COVID and couldn't go to school or otherwise you know you had no other option you know to to get them through you know a period of time I'm going to give you some paid time off to go get tested you know get vaccinated you know whatever so those are those are credits associated with I gave people paid time off didn't make them take six day sick days um to do stuff related to the pandemic that that you know is is fairly broad but you know is kind of kind of you know what what doesn't qualify under here under this you know i mean i suppose you could try to take it but you know i wouldn't i would have a different policy is i'm just afraid to come into the office and i refuse to work i mean that you know it's not really what this is supposed to be targeted towards but you know that that also could be an area but that's 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 the one that's available associated with the with the pandemic um you know, what you do with what, what you should have been doing with that one. And if you didn't do it, you would go back to your payroll company and say, Hey, I need to look into this is that, you know, in 20, in 2020 and 2021, um, that should have been a credit applied to payroll taxes that you need to remit, um, with your, with your tax returns. And, you know, most payroll companies had a separate time code where you could report how much wages qualified under that category. Um, you know, category number two is, some, is stuff that's been around for a while. I'm going to get the um, the limits wrong on this, but I'm going to be directionally correct. Um, so for uh, retirement plans and health insurance, if you're a smaller employer and there's a, there's a revenue size associated with the smaller, small employer, I believe, um, that is pretty low. Um, and then there's a, there's a wage component too of this, you get, which I think the wage is like $50,000, um, that you pay somebody for anybody below that you get a tax credit for, and I want to say, I want to say it's like 500 bucks. I mean, it's not insignificant. Um, you get a tax credit for having them be in your retirement plan or your health insurance plan. So it's a good way to be able to offset the expense to you for providing the benefit um for your employees so those are the those are the big kind of two categories um that exist you know one pandemic related the other one related to you know smaller company employee um health insurance and uh retirement retirement planning and said those are really um size restricted um from the company perspective and then wage restricted from the employee perspective cool Anything else you want to yeah. elaborate on that topic? Yeah, I'll hit the job and employment credits because this is a pretty this is a pretty important one. So, um, 
if you are if it's if it's super easy to do or it's super easy to you know post out to participants gary or whatever i mean we did a video on each one of the work opportunity credits that's available to people um but so you know it's it's certain classes of people so veterans that have been unemployed um felons that have been unemployed you know people that have been on you know food stamps that that or other aid that you now give a job to so you know it's it, it's some good categories and they're pretty valuable credits you know i mean it's it's a lot you know in terms of what you could get i want to you know pretty pretty significant in terms of helping offset um the pay associated with, with some of these folks but there's one key <laughs> The key is this is a um, two-sided process. Like you have to document and apply for these credits in the hiring. Like you, they show up on your corporate tax return and then ultimately your personal return if you're a flow-through entity, but you have to fill out the forms associated with establishing the credit, you know, as the person is being hired. Like you don't, you don't, you don't go back. Like this is one of those weird ones where you don't get to go backwards and say, oh, wow, I didn't know that existed. You know, let me go back and just, you know, do the analysis and oh my gosh, I've got all these people because the whole idea here is you're supposed to be targeting um, these people as part of your, your hiring process and you get a credit for doing so instead of retroactively fitting a fact pattern, um, you know, based on something. So, you know, if you, if you think that, that, if you kind of survey your workforce and you say, wow, I, that, that kind of is what my employee workforce looks at, you may have lost out on some earlier credits, but at the same time, you know, you can insert this in your hiring um, process. Just to ask a few clarifying questions to somebody. And if they, they trigger a, hey, this person could qualify for credit, you want to go ding, 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 you know, let me go, let me go apply for it. What, I don't really know kind of what are going to be appropriate HR questions to be able to ask if somebody qualifies or not, but you know, we're members of the Employers Association. They're a valuable resource um, to us and our clients. You know, I would think they might have something in terms of, all right, what's okay to ask versus what's not okay to ask uh, in terms of establishing the, the, the employment credit. I mean, so some states one... will offer, also offer state incentives for um, wages, but, you know, generally those are going to be, you know, pretty significant you know, pretty significant job creation, you know, type things. One more that I'll mention, and if you guys want to learn more, I can connect you with Dan Flaherty of Mountain West Consulting, but he cracked the code. He, he has an organization that does fractional sales, like a VP of sales. And he, he works with small, medium-sized companies, but he was like the head of global sales for GE for one of their divisions. But what he found was that there are tax credits for training that um, basically fund his, <laughs> his program, which is pretty cool. Um, and he's seen really, really great results. And it's based on county, I think, but um, where, where you're domiciled. So if you guys are interested in that, or if you know Dan Flaherty, just reach out to him. But if you don't know him and you want a connection, just let me know. I'm at GFREY at trustbgw.com, GFREY at trustbgw.com, and I'll help you connect to him too. So the last question, so that Adam can get those snow boots and snow pants on. He's got, you know, bright green neon uh, snow pants from what I hear. Just kidding. Um, so here is the last question of the day. Are you interested in having us do a session on confessions of a former IRS agent? And we actually know one. <laughs> it's actually a colleague of uh, Jack Santig Yellow. <laughs> so, all right, well, that's <laughs> 10 of 10. <laughs> all right, so yes, I'm gonna take it. A screenshot of this because I've got to. <laughs> I, I got to be able to show this to Mr. Santignano just in case my screenshot didn't work. I'm going to take it here. <laughs> All right, awesome. So 100% said yes. Confessions of an IRS agent. We will tee that up 
and see what we can do to make that happen. <clears throat> and if we can make it happen next week, we'll do it. If, if not, it'll be uh, coming up soon. Another one that I want to tee up is, as well is uh, a group named Jay Galt. And they have, um, they have a program that's pretty reasonable, I think, uh, for being able to bolster your company credit report and your credit score versus personal, you know, that's always this interesting balance of going from where you're personally guaranteeing everything to where you can get off of those personal guarantees and your company has the credit worthiness and the credit scores that the banks will pay attention to. Um, plus, they also do an annual um, company valuation as part of that, which is pretty cool. So we'll get those guys teed up at some point here too. But, you know, we're still in busy season 315 just ended with corporate filing deadlines. We got 415 rocking up. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, putting up with two years of this. <laughs> it's been fun. Adam, thank you so much uh, to you and your family for um, delaying the start of being on the slopes at Steamboat, but enjoy your time and stay safe. Sure, Gary. Thanks a lot. And thanks, for everybody, for being on. <clears throat> All right. See you guys. Have a great day. All right. See ya.